Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back for the after lunch session. It's great to have you here again. I hope you had a good lunch, a relaxing lunch. Um, a session this afternoon is on evolving consumer finance business models. And if anything we've learned over the morning and in DC was that if you are looking for one model that would address all of the questions and provide the answer to the future, I think there is none. So I'm sorry to disappoint you on that front. But what I do assure you is that there is a wide variety of business models as many models as there are people on this panel, and probably more. And so there's a great number of exciting gateways, and that's what we are set to explore this afternoon in this session. Um, although this is the afternoon after lunch session, I'm sure this will be an exciting session. You know, I think what we've uh, discovered in terms of speaking of business models is that there's a great gamut of issues that we could talk on. And so instead of trying to go into everything, I'd just like to pick up on a few themes that appear to be consistently emerging across the sessions. Uh, issues around sort of thinking about the different mechanisms through which financing is occurring and the variety of models that is being used. The issue of technology and risk, something that we haven't delved into as much, but I'd like to draw upon that. And then maybe to end with a couple of comments on what are sort of the information or analysis that practitioners need in order to scale their businesses further. So Veronica, let me start with you in terms of uh, risk, if I may. And uh, you know, in, in your entity, you work with not only the end users, but also the middle layer cooperative. So you're sort of an umbrella group. And in some sense, the risk then goes through two layers. My question to you is, how do you manage or how do you assess the risk of end users that comes percolated to you via sort of the cooperative intermediaries? How do you assess the risks? How do you manage it? And when a problem does occur, how do you respond quickly to try to contain it? Uh, thank you. Uh, first, I would want to appreciate the organizers of this forum and particularly for inviting us so that we can share uh, what we do in the cooperative movement back home in Kenya. Um, as an umbrella body for circles in Kenya, our members are the corporates, that is uh, the circles. Indeed, we have about 3,000 circles in our fold who interpret to slightly more than 10 million individual members. That's a big, big group. And uh, what we do at uh, Cusco level, we lend to the circles. And uh, the circles then will on lend to their individual members. So at Cusco level, what we've tried to do is uh, to come up with the department for the credit control unit. And uh, what uh, we do with this department is that uh, uh, the moment we lend out funds uh, to these uh, corporates, we will let them know so that they can start the tracking of the loan repayment right from that level. And uh, the liars with the suckers, uh, the moment they realize that possibly uh, the loan is not being repaid as scheduled. And uh, where we realize that possibly a circle uh, defaulted in repayment of loans, then we have to engage quite a number of mechanisms. Of course, we have our people who are in the field. We have divided Kenya into regions. And in those regions, we have our uh, marketing uh, uh, people, a marketing team. Uh, in fact, our, our people are about 80% marketers. So our marketing team is the one that will first go to uh, uh, the circle who might be defaulting and uh, bring uh, the issue of, uh, of uh, uh, repayments, non-repayments to them. And if uh, it escalates and it is, uh, the loan is not repaid within some time, then of course, um, occasionally or eventually, we'll find ourselves uh, engaging legal 
uh, practitioners so that we can also ensure that the loan is repaid. Those are some of the ways that we address it. Right, right. Yeah. So Paul, to you next, um, is, you know, is, is risk the thing that makes you lose your hair or thin your hair? <laughs> but more specifically, um, there was a lot of things we talked about in terms of asset finance and consumer finance. And I wanted to use SIMPA as kind of a way to maybe distill out the difference a little bit. Uh, in your particular case, you're looking at asset finance. How do you look at risk measurements? Uh, how do you use the mechanisms you have? What, what kind of mechanisms you have internally to be assess, able to assess those risks so that you can offer then investors a pretty sound system of risk containment and management? Um, so usually we think about, I mean, in the sector, of course, we think about, you know, the consumer credit risk, that risk that the customer won't pay you back. Um, but there's another kind of risk, which I think is really important to the whole, um, to our business, which is the technology risk. You know, if the customer is choosing to buy a product, they're taking the risk that that product is going to continue to perform for them and deliver the services that they want that product to deliver, right? The consumer, in the case of a solar home system, right, with a solar panel, a battery, lights, uh, mobile phone charging, maybe a fan, a, a product like that, the consumer doesn't really want all that technology. What they want is lighting for cooking. They want lighting for safety. They don't want to step on a snake when they go out early in the morning to milk the cows. They want uh, the cooling function that a fan provides. Uh, they want to be able to charge their mobile phone so they can communicate with people. So they, those are the motivators for the, for the purchase. But there, there may be various products on the market. And in a cash sale business, the consumer is being saddled with all this technology risk. There, it's the consumer's responsibility to evaluate different products and try to decide whether product A or product B or C will solve the problems that they want to solve, will do the jobs that they want. So um, this is one reason why solar home systems are not selling very well. I mean, of course, they're very expensive. Um, and to ask the customer to, to save up all this money, make such a very large purchase for a product category that they've never owned before and don't necessarily understand, is a, is, um, is, it's understandable that most people don't want to do that. In an asset finance model, what we're saying to the customer is, don't worry about the technology. We promise to you that that product will deliver the, the, uh, the goods. It will deliver the services that you want that product to deliver. And we say, if it doesn't work, uh, don't pay. So in an asset finance model, such as we have, which is really a solar leasing model, we're providing the customer this assurance that the product will perform as we promise it will perform. And if it doesn't perform, you don't have to pay. And that's very, very different than um, a customer, say, taking a loan from a bank in order to buy a product from a third party. I met a customer who was considering taking a loan from a bank to purchase a solar product, and he said, um, he said, you know, I've done the math. I could take a loan from this bank, and I could buy this product from this company over here, and the money I was spending on kerosene, I'd, I, I would save, and I'd be able to make my bank payment. But a year from now, two years from now, what if that product no longer works? Uh, then I have to roll back to kerosene, but I still owe the bank. So I'd be paying twice for kerosene, and it's already pretty expensive. Uh, in an asset leasing model or asset finance model, that risk does not sit with the customer. That risk sits with the company. If the product doesn't work, we don't get paid. And that's a, a core piece of the value proposition. And that's a different kind of risk that uh, you know, is very different than us sort of assessing the credit risk of a customer. And I think this is, uh, comes to the point of what Sam said in DC, which was people are not interested in buying the product. They're interested in the service, right? Um, in your particular case, you're also then selling not the product, but a service in some sense. So what's your view in terms of, uh, you know, how do you look at the risk of energy versus the product? Is that, is that something that you're looking to both identify and manage this risk, given that your supply chain is coming all the way from China 
obviously the risk is being compounded quite significantly because you're a little bit further removed, at least geographically and over time, from yeah. your supplier. Yeah. Can you just pass the mic, please? Oh, there is one. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, we, we perceive it in the same way, I would say. Uh, maybe we can give it a little bit of an, an extra layer even. I mean, indeed, like there are these risks of like credit repayments, uh, the risk of the, the product failing. But in the end, that all results into the relationship that you're building with that client. So what we don't want a client for uh, two years while he's repaying the, uh, the credit facility. We want to have that client with us for the next 10, 15, 20 years as he basically expands his, uh, his solar system to like access more services, uh, access a uh, bigger television, access the internet through a computer, um, get more cooling solutions. Um, so, and, and therefore it's really important that we build a really good client relationship. And that's also even if we do offer the product on credit and we lower the barrier for a client to buying a product like this, it's still a significant investment in our case. The client still pays a 15, 20% deposit like he still has to think twice before he actually uh, makes that investment. And what we see is, is that clients actually, they start looking around. They see, okay, is that system working with my neighbor? So if there is any problem with, with the system, whether it's with the credit or whether it's with how we provide a, a service uh, to that client, so did we do the sales process correctly? Did we actually do the after sales correctly? Like it significantly impacts like our yeah, customer relationship, so to say, and our ability to scale the company, because that's in the end what we want. We want to sell as many of these systems as possible to as many people that, that need and want, uh, want these kind of solutions. So and I think that's, that's a really significant part if you look at, at risk for us, is like managing that client, client relationship and leveraging that to be able to scale, scale the company uh, beyond where we are right but now. And, and so far, uh, it appears consistently that clearly service, the ability to continuously deliver service is a critical part of managing that relationship with your client. Okay. Let me turn to um, both Chris and Amit. Um, you guys are microfinance institutions, and I guess there's one more uh, layer, which is, you know, I think Sam mentioned it, the problem of fat fingers, and I'll find the, the analogy here. You have many layers of, um, you know, loan officers, field officers that are helping you push the products. Uh, in DC, we talked about the notion of ransom marketing or forced marketing. How do you control for that risk in your models? Uh, consumer finance is interesting to those customers because they're in need of that kind. So trying to push a product through may be easier. So can I take your comment on how you think you're managing, or both identifying and working through the risks that is posed by your operational staff that are dispersing these products and the kinds of incentives or disincentives they have? Chris? As a microfinance organization, when we, uh, when we wanted to do this energy uh, lending, we wanted to do uh, that in a big scale. It should be a viable product range. And uh, uh, so with a theme that impacting the, you know, the climate change and the environment. And for that matter, we had a, a, a wide variety of uh, incentives. In DC, when I you know, remarked about incentives, there was some interest on incentives. So uh, no. after that, I just analyzed our own incentive pattern. And I see that the incentives have really you know, worked well. It is not only motivated, but also has thrilled the loan officers and the field staff to do more business. Yeah, so uh, uh, the, as far as the incentives and the pressure from the management is there to uh, you know, distribute or the find the, uh, the solar or the renewable energy products for the sales, there could be, uh, you know, wrong selling, ransom selling, etc. cetera. And, uh, but how to control it? See, we are thinking of, uh, in, you know, this uh, implementing another type of incentive is that impact incentive. Because very recently we took, after two years of running the program, we took an impact assessment by an independent consultancy group where they have pointed out some gaps in the process and some hints here and there that wrong selling has already happened. So uh, anyway, we are accountable to the society and the, our investors for the impact that we have to produce by you know, managing this portfolio. 
So therefore, that responsibility, we want to push to the loan officer level as well, so that they'll be very careful and they'll be very you know, careful and selective and meticulous uh, in their selling as well. And then our, our process in microfinance is that there is frequent customer meet. And the customer meet is an opportunity for the customer to directly speak to us, is there anything wrong things happening at the, uh, you know, at the loan officer, field officer's level. So that is the communication channel we all the time use and to understand any, uh, any mistakes or uh, any out of the way uh, approaches in our field staff. Uh, that are the two methods that we currently use in order to uh, avoid the risk of you know, inflicting a customer with an un, you know, uh, uh, you know, a product that the customer uh, does not want. Yes. What, about, uh, what about you, Amit? Is that the same sort of uh, no. oh, issues for you? Uh, something similar, but the way we viewed this was slightly different. We looked at, there is always a reason to sell, and there's a reason to get an incentive. So we said that, let's look back and say, what is it that we need to do? So the first thing we realized is that this should not be done by the same company. So we formed a separate company. We looked at access to energy as a business and not as a division of a microfinance company. So once we stepped back, two things became very apparent. One is that we had to make sure that the loan officer, whose prime objective is to sell, to give a loan, and he's giving a blessing to the people. While selling is receiving. He has to sell the product. So we realized that he was uncomfortable doing this because whenever he had power, the sale was easy. Whenever he had to request, the sale was very difficult. So what we did was we embedded a person who was a specialist in this field along with us, loan officer. And what he did was he, when he went to a meeting, he never let him oversell the product. He gave the presentation to the customers and when we launched in a new area, he only sold it to the customers who had an urgent need for the product. So that the first five to 10 installations were perfect. Then the word of mouth got along and more and more customers joined the bandwagon. After about two or three visits, our team did not need to go again. The loan officer with, his ex with the actual expertise that he had seen was able to sell this. And now wisely. The second thing we did was we realized as we stepped back, we realized that there were a lot of smaller NGOs, smaller microfinance companies, and a lot of corporates who wanted to enter this space, but didn't know how to, didn't have the sales expertise, didn't have the systems. So what we did was we tied up with a lot of these smaller NGOs, MFIs, and corporates. The third thing we did, which was very unique in our sector, was we identified a large brand and got them to enter this space. Then that brand was Panasonic. Post that, what we did was we worked with them to enable all their service centers to be able to service the product at a village or a district level. We then changed the paradigm. We said that a customer, when you buy a product from me or my partner, you are stuck with me or my partner. But here you have a brand who has said, my service centers are available to you 24 by 7, and I'm taking the responsibility. So what it did was it changed the comp It's like buying a mobile phone. A mobile phone can be sold by anybody, but the service center is of the mobile company. So now we got a huge skin in the game from our partner. We also started working with them to design new products based on our understanding of the market. And we've successfully launched three products together. So I think we have taken multiple steps to de-risk our business. And the fourth and the final thing we did was we did not become product specific. We understood the customer needs. We realized some customers couldn't buy products. So we went through an entrepreneur model to lease the product to them. 
we started offering trade finance to our channel with a larger credit period, and they offered informal credit to their customers. That took away a lot of paperwork. It built a lot of trust in the community. And most of these loans, as we realized when we went along, were without any interest. So the customer felt he was getting a great deal. So there's, uh, in, in all of this, I think you'll see that the consistent theme is variety. So I hope you're not going to ask me to summarize everything that was said, because I think variety is clearly the variety of responses that go with this business model. But maybe that's a great way uh, to turn to you, Sam, on this, because I think what we're hearing from each of the companies is that they manage, they identify and manage risk in a slightly different way, which means that at the heart of it, also must, you must have the tools to be able to manage that in an operational sense, which comes down to the issue of technology. This is very diffuse lending, disaggregated over many, many different this. Can you speak a little bit about the need for technology to emerge, to really operationalize these business models to, to scale? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's perfect segue. It's almost like this was scripted, really. It, um, oh, it was not. It was not. <laughs> So but, um, after lunch. <laughs> I've, never, I've never really thought about it in this way before, but essentially, we are in the game of risk removal. That's what we do. We build the tools to remove risk at every level of the, every stage of the process. So you were talking about the technology risk. Um, we minimize that by centralizing everything. We um, give people the tools to build central energy hubs in a village. So people are buying power from us. They're not buying technology. It's energy as a service rather than a product. So their risk is much lower. Um, we're removing the operational risk for project owners because they can then gather their revenues remotely through people paying with their mobile phones through M-Pesa and other services like this. The tools also allow them to be able to manage a portfolio of grids, so their operational risk is lower. We're reducing the risk for investors in the sense that we're providing very high resolution data transparency from everything from the individual transactions to the portfolio level, um, tracking your investments, looking at the financial forecasting, that sort of thing, but also de-risking it for the bigger donor space as well, in the sense that we're another player demystifying it with data. We're providing another data level, another data layer for uh, donors, people who are interested in uh, comparing grid access to um, uh, income levels, that sort of thing. So we are just providing another kind of data layer for that. So the key is, uh, you mentioned technology, but I think the key is deeper than that. The key is this data. And data is ubiquitous. I mean, our world has been increasingly built on that. And all we're really doing is bringing that data, that capability so into the this space. So it's the ability to sort of bring all of this data into a platform relatively inexpensively, quickly, in real time, and then to offer the analytics to be able to do operational decision making. That's essentially the platform you're talking about. Yes, absolutely. And the, the part of it, on, on the, the actual coalface level, the technology is allowing people to buy power in the same way that they buy airtime for their phones. So it's about making that much simpler. Right. But at this kind of higher level, the data is very key. So we were talking about these energy diaries. We're collecting all of their energy diary information automatically in real time. I was having lots of conversations earlier with people involved in this. We can see whether someone is plugging in a television. We can see if someone is plugging in a mobile phone. We can see if the battery in someone's mobile phone needs to be replaced. We can, and that data becomes very interesting in lots of different ways. From an MFI perspective, we can track someone's payment patterns. Right. So you can see if someone has got a relatively good credit rating because they never run out of credit. They're always checking their system, topping up accordingly versus someone who has a very erratic payment model. Likewise, that data could potentially be interesting to someone offering low energy televisions because you, we can say these three people have a, a, a good credit rating and B, they're using a very low efficiency television. So that data is can be used in a myriad of ways, and we haven't even got the first beginning of an idea of what the real value of that rich data is. Right. We're just and collecting so it. So Paul, let me link up uh, on that, because you know the Simpa black box was kind of the, the start of the whole uh, Simpa story, this pay-as-you-go systems, and you thought initially in your early days that this might be the technology that others would adopt. And you sort of changed away from that for variety of reasons, maybe even the, the market is not mature enough. But how central is this notion of the pay-as-you-go intelligence 
that is there, how central is it to your business model? Could you still have an asset financing business model minus the pay-as-you-go system? Well, I'll just comment on the, the title of our panel, Evolving Consumer Finance Business Models. I looked at that and I thought, yeah, that's great. We have an evolving consumer <laughs> finance business model. We've evolved quite a bit since we got started. Um, yes, we invented and even successfully patented this prepaid metering and mobile payments technology. Um, it does three jobs. Uh, the first job of the technology is to create this pay-as-you-go experience for the customer. So the customer can prepay for energy days just like they prepay for mobile airtime. Um, secondly, it is a risk mitigation tool for the investors who are ultimately investing in the upfront capital cost of that equipment. Um, you know, we have today about 15,000 customers spread out over about 1,500 villages. And we're still, I mean, we're obviously just getting started. We're in a tiny corner of one state, Uttar Pradesh in India. Um, and the market opportunity is probably 100 million households. Um, so this risk mitigation function we think is key and that's, that's one role of the technology. The third role of the technology is to reduce the transaction costs of collecting very small payments from a very large number of customers that are spread out, uh, very you know, geographically dispersed. We don't think we could scale as a commercial enterprise to address that 100 million household market opportunity in India without technology like that. And is, is uh, data collection also a part of that technology? Are you collecting and processing that oh, data? Very actively? much so, very much so. Every transaction um, passes through our servers. Every payment that's made by every customer. We have um, about a thousand agents that have prepaid us for Simpa currency. We have a record of uh, you know, all of the payments they've made to us and every transaction that they've processed. And of course, every customer transaction, how much each customer has paid, how much they still owe before they can become an owner of the system. We have payment points, these agents that are sort of recharge agents. We know the balance that sits at each of these agents and we know which customers are served by those agents. So we know if the agent has enough balance to serve the customers in his catchment for the next five days because we know which customers will need to be recharged. And based on that, um, we know who to target, which uh, agents to call and say, look, you don't have enough money. You may think you have enough money, but we've added more customers in your catchment, so you need to top up your own account. Uh -huh. uh, so the, the data is absolutely helping us um, uh, just drive operating efficiencies and better, um, uh, yeah, that's, that's the primary uh, value that we're getting from that technology today. Excellent. Peter, if I could just uh, turn to you, and I'm sorry I called you earlier Sam, but I think, you know, this is the post-list session and then you also look exactly. like Sam. You, you look, uh, have you ever, it's the striking resemblance with, with Sam. It's, uh, so, I think what we heard Sam say, and then Paul sort of reiterate in a different way, is that the technology is there. And I think we're aware of other technologies that are there in this space. In your view, is this mature? Are you using it? Uh, is this sort of you know, management and recording and real-time monitoring? Is that because you use so much of the products from suppliers that you have to travel thousands of miles away from? Um, is the management monitoring uh, tools and technologies, is that mature enough for you? Is that a cost-efficient solution for you? Well, uh, let me agree with saying that indeed data is key. I mean, like getting like data from, from the systems, from like understanding how clients make payments, I think that really drives like how we start to understand our clients and like how we can make our businesses more efficient, how we can offer better solutions to our clients. Um, to say whether this kind of technology is mature and if we figured out exactly how to use it, I would probably say no. I think everyone is still looking for exactly like how do you use this kind of technology. There was, well, especially when like our kind of companies got came up, there was a really strong like drive to say, well, you need pay-as-you-go technology to manage the repayment risk. You need to have like some sort of like remote connect, disconnect technology in these systems to enforce uh, people repaying. Actually, I think we've seen that that is not maybe necessarily the case. I mean, we've we've always cautiously approached this kind of technology, 
we really wanted to build sound procedures and policies in, in the company to make sure that we like really understand the client, we work with the client, um, and we actually see that portfolio health is not at risk. That, that's one of our least, least concerns at the moment. I mean, we have portfolio at risk below 2.5%. Right. Clients are repaying. I mean, they're repaying at different rates, like they're always paying late. I mean, still lots of things that we need to learn and improve there, but technology is not the key there. Um, and understanding exactly how we're going to use that technology, I think everyone is still, it's still a bit of a holy grail. Everyone is still searching, searching for it. Right. Um, so I guess that means, Sam, if you thought your job was done, I guess it's only getting started. Yeah, I would agree that it's, uh, it's only getting, getting started. Evolving in many different ways, evolving in many different ways. Let's, let's, let's uh, turn to a slightly different part of that, that question, which is you know, maybe the microfinance and the, the umbrella organization that Vanessa represents. Um, if there is technology, what about the issue of adoption? Like you, currently, you must be using some technologies, and I know that we've struggled with uh, a metering in the microgrid, which was a story in itself. Uh, for another session over drinks, maybe. Um, but, uh, you know, why don't you start? What about the issue of adoption? These technologies are available, and I think some of them are, maybe not as mature or not as fully defined. How easy or difficult is it for your business model, the type of enterprise you represent, to be able to adopt that technology in a way that you can quickly leverage it for operational decision making? Okay, so for us, uh, as Vayam, we are slightly different in that context. We have multiple partners, multiple entrepreneurs, all of who sell our product. So we have to build, a, we have built an extremely strong MIS and an extremely strong stocking and sale mechanism, which we are tracking. That's on one side of our business. The second side of our business, which is an ongoing business where we have some of partners here, where we are trying to build solutions on a shared service model which are affordable by a larger population. That's where we are finding that we need to build different systems. Systems where some of the answers have been given by some of my colleagues here, but systems where the usage and income generation activities need to be bought into the larger paradigm. And until that is not done, I don't think any of the systems that we are providing are sustainable with the customer. So we are trying to understand that. We are trying to understand what it takes to make that happen. And we're trying to build systems through which we can track and monitor this. So when you say you're trying to build systems, are you actually trying to build systems yourself internally, or you're expecting some third party providers to, to offer you some solutions that you can leverage? So I think we are looking at, we are open to both, but but you'd rather but, not do the IT if you had a choice. I would not do the IT, but my challenge is slightly different. Most of the systems are built to monitor. Yeah. None of the systems are built to look at livelihood. And that's where we differ. Because for us, this is just one part of the solution that we need. We need a much larger system. Payments, collections, what is the usage? That's just a data analytics. But we need something more, and we need something higher. And I think that's where we need to work closely with all the partners here yeah. to figure out what that means. But Veronica, you work obviously with you know, 3,000 cooperatives that then represent almost 10 million members and associates. Um, and there must be considerable variety in the type of technology that they use to manage that. How do you think of technology standardization within your umbrella? And what, you know, where are the bottlenecks or difficulties for you in terms of the adoption of that technology, in terms of your operations? Uh, yes, working with uh, quite a large uh, uh, number of uh, organizations when it comes to issues of technology, we will all agree that uh, almost every organization will come up with different types of softwares to deal with different issues. And uh, as an umbrella organization, we have always found ourselves trying to come up with some uniformity in uh, the, the, 
the types of software that our organizations use, so that even when we introduce a product, like the product that we have on clean and efficient cookstoves, we can have a platform which can give us almost a uni uh, uniform uh, reporting. And uh, currently, we are working on um, a platform where the end user, the moment that person has applied for a loan, it can be registered in the platform. Uh, that is something that we are working on. It is uh, still not uh, uh, in force, but we are believing that that will happen. Of course, we, are, we do not have the capacity within ourselves. We are working with others that uh, are already in such, uh, using such platforms, and we believe it will assist us. Uh, the other thing that uh, possibly I would want to bring out is that on the cookstove uh, product that we are we are selling. As I had mentioned, our business as an umbrella body is indeed to sell money, not the technological product. So what we've done at Cusco level, we have partnered with the distributors who are the ones that are releasing the cook stoves to mm -hmm. the end user. And uh, initially, we even found out that we started with one distributor, and we had quite a number of challenges, which possibly I can also say the worries, uh, because uh, we found out that uh, sometimes the issue of demand could not be met by one, uh, uh, one, um, one distributor. So we brought on board a number of other distributors who now have their own uh, systems uh, which they are using, on reporting, on ensuring that uh, the end consumer gets the cookstoves. And uh, basically, that is how we are going about it. And uh, indeed, besides the challenges that we have found of several uh, distributors uh, working together, we have also found quite a, number benef uh, quite a number of other benefits because uh, demand is met, mostly. Uh, the issue of marketing, because you'll agree when you are selling money, then you really need to, to do a lot of marketing and uh, that's a big challenge that uh, we had initially, but now with the inclusion of several other distributors, indeed we are working with six distributors, uh, some of these challenges. So also when, when you are thinking of these challenges, it's not just so much about managing your payments or, or, or managing your customers, it's really about the entire business. Everything seamlessly from you know, demand generation to supply management to et cetera, et cetera. And I think, Chris, I want to turn to you because you have begun at least to be able to think in ESAF about these kind of systems. Um, you know, having seen your system that there's inventory management links it with the microfinance loans that's given. Um, and you, have, you actually have worked with some companies to develop these, these systems. What's your view in terms of not so much the development side of it, but really in the adoption. When you, when you look at your business model and you see how critical technology is, and I want to push this into my staff and in terms of operations to be able to make these kinds of operational decisions, what is the challenge there in, in adopting this kind of technology? Yes. <coughs> it is, uh, whether it is adoption or adaptation. The companies, they make a product. You say, this is the product we have to adopt it. So I have been fighting with all the manufacturers. These are not the type of configuration our customers require. You make little changes so that our customers will be very comfortable. So, so that is one of the major challenges because they, they have, you know, one, one, one product we are dealing, I told them, it is a, a very beautiful product. It is not suitable for a tough villager but it is good for an urban customer. But another type of product is good for the rural person, but it is not good for the urban. And some other things, you know, they come with the tappings. First tap will be uh, minimum brightness, then second, then third, then fourth. No woman will press fourth to get the brightness. Even at home, my wife will do only two tapping. And I know that she will quit that product if I do not go and do the other pressing, make it enough bright for the kitchen. So therefore, I, I still, I, last week I met them and I asked them, why do you have so much of pressing? One, two, one, one dim, one bright, finished. Then, you no, know, such, you know, adaptation.
to the uh, you know, behavioral behaviors of the preferences of the customer is uh, really be looked into to in order to make uh, the product uh, suitable for the customer. The product must be friendly to the customer. And uh, the one example, uh, you know, this the stove, firewood uh, cook stove. See, we, what, a, what our perception is that cook stove will be used to cook so that there will be temperature, water will be boiled, rice will be boiled, you know, cooked and everything. Then I was touring to this North India. Then one woman asked, told me, Sir, now I am very free and enjoy my cooking because I can take the fire stove, firewood cook stove to outside and cook, seeing the nature. I can even take it to the place where my children are playing. So I need not be locked into the kitchen all the time. So, see, these are the values the customer associate with the products. So whether the product manufacturers are very sensitive and sensible to adapt their child to the requirements and the, uh, of the, uh, you know, the, the customers uh, that they have. So uh, right now, I mean, last year, you, last fiscal year, you, you crossed over 100,000 units, both in terms of lighting, cook stoves, et cetera. And if I, if, you, if I sort of pick up on what you're saying, there's a wide variety of feedback that's coming to you. You know, some people want two switches, <laughs> four switches, lighter cook stoves, bigger cook stoves, whatever. But how, uh, it, so at your back office, somebody is sitting and processing all this, and I just assume that they're drowning in all this information. So how do you capture that? I mean, physically, how do you capture that information, package it in a way that you speak with your suppliers and get them to change it? How do you capture that information? What, what systems do you currently use to capture yeah. that system? So uh, the one system is that I personally use it. And so see whether what are the limitations uh, with me and what are, the, you know, what are the limitation challenges I face to convince my wife what are the challenges I face to convince my mother? The one, one, pro, one person can... It's like a home-based IT system. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If one person is able to convince both the wife and mother, I think it is... <laughs> that's good. <laughs> so <laughs> It's a that, unique domestic business model. <laughs> Secondly, you know, professionally when I'm speaking, we conduct the focus group discussion studies, the, the, the discussions in the, uh, with the customers. So wide variety of... We will do a few... Na, few uh, focus group discussions for the urban and in different states, rural different states, of men in different states, of women in different states, of teenage girls in different states. These are all gives us a lot of information. And also we, uh, we uh, take the opinion of the field officers and uh, so that uh, that all will be pooled. Uh, then uh, we come across some sort of configuration that will be comfortable uh, you know, for a specific uh, uh, you know, segment of the customers. Great. So I'd just like to pause here, and before I, I throw the floor open to questions from the floor, um, I'd like to ask everybody just one question, and anybody can go. So the question is, you know, think about just one assumption that you're making about your market, about your business model, that you're not so sure about. And, and you want more data or more evidence or more analysis that can help you make a better decision in terms of the issue surrounding that assumption. So what would that be? And the only advantage to going first is because you don't get to repeat what somebody has already said. So who wants to go first? Can I? Sure. <laughs> You're holding the mic, so go yeah, for yeah, it. Yeah. See, uh, yes, Michelle, that is a very uh, right question because most of the companies jump into this uh, space because we come across the statistics, so many billions of uh, liters of kerosene is used, so many millions of children are, uh, or women are affected by lung diseases, and uh, so, uh, so many millions are without electricity. That's right. But where are these million? When we go into the field, these people are fragmented. So suppose uh, if a microfinance company is operating a branch, in the branch, that area, how many of the millions are there? And in that branch area, other companies are also operating. So the millions are highly scattered, and this white population is fragmented and in the hold of other players. So definitely a company organization should know, ISA should know, how many of our customers, 
how many of our prospective customers are having this need. That is a very valid uh, data we would like to have, so that we'll be able to plan, and you know, we'll have a very meticulous business plan for five years. That's great. Next. I think I saw Paul's hand, but you go, since uh, you're closer to me. Sorry, Paul. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, this is a race to the finish, so <laughs> to use your words. <laughs> okay, in the cooperative movement, we have a variety of products, but indeed, um, renewable energy has not been one of the products that we have uh, uh, for a long time embraced. Uh, when, as an umbrella body, we thought of going to the direction of renewable energy, of course there was the assumption, will, will we, um, how will we go about it? Will we really uh, make an impact? This is an issue that we are now addressing because basically we are telling circles that this is a product that you can start as a, a revenue stream in your organization. Uh, uh, beside it, uh, bringing in some revenues in the organization, it will also make uh, life improving uh, uh, impact. And uh, indeed, we have seen it happen. I want to give a very small story of uh, uh, how women in the countryside are appreciating uh, the renewable energy GICOs, the ones that we are uh, releasing to the market using our, our distributors. The ladies are saying, uh, since I started using the clean and efficient cookstoves, there is a lot of love in the family. How? Uh, in our setup, the kitchen is normally outside. Most of the people who have uh, traveled in Kenya know that. The kitchen is outside there. I can see Mike nodding his head. He's a part of the team that does that. So the woman has the responsibility of cooking all alone in the kitchen without talking to anyone. You know, uh, inhaling a lot of soot all alone. You know, a lot of mucus, a lot of tears as she cooks with the traditional cook stoves. But the moment the women started using the clean and efficient cook stoves, they can move the cook stoves to the sitting room where they are with their family members. She is cooking as she is chatting. So that is telling us that the family is coming, you know, closer together. And indeed, even as we made our assumption whether this is something that's going to be appreciated, we can already say that this is something that we all must, you know, drive towards. And that is what I also ask others that we can partner with in ensuring that the woman leaves the kitchen which is outside there in the darkness where she can, I had, step on the snake as she moves to the sitting room. That is where we should all go. Right. Thank so you. The issue of impact. Paul. Yeah, I'll, I'll pick up on this gender issue. It's something we want to understand more. Um, in Western Uttar Pradesh, where we're selling, we find we can only sell to the men. The women are, are in the home, in the background. When strangers come, they, they immediately retreat into the home uh, and are veiled. Um, so men are making the purchase decisions. And yet, when we create a forum, when we bring in women ourselves, and we create a forum where both the men and the women can talk about the product, it's the women who are most passionate and most happy with the product. Uh, they're most tuned into, most sensitive to the, the educational benefits for their children, so they always mention that. They mention the cooking benefits. Um, I've heard men say that the food tastes better under solar lights. And I've heard that, it, truly, it's, it's been explained as uh, fewer insects in the food. Um, <laughs> when you can see what you're cooking and you can uh, pick out things that have got into your ingredients, uh, it's a real problem. Of course, if you've ever left your food on your counter in a tropical climate, you'll see within a half an hour you've got ants all over it. So uh, these are people, of course, who don't have refrigeration, don't have uh, great places to store their, their ingredients. So we want to better understand how to work in this environment. How are women using our products differently than men? And how do we activate 
women to women channels of communication to, to sell. We've tried, we've introduced a customer referral program where the initial sale is happening male to male with our male sales agent, the male head of household. Uh, and then we introduce a customer referral program with coupons handed to the woman of the household that she can share with her friends and, and sisters uh, to recommend Simpa. And if she recommends Simpa and a new customer signs up, she gets 200 rupees worth of free energy days and her friend who signed up gets 200 rupees of free energy days. So this is a method we're, we're trying now. Uh, last month, about 26% of our sales came through customer referrals like this. Um, we think mostly through women-to-women -women, uh, channels of communication, but we're not certain of that. So more research. Um, I was very interested to, uh, to um, uh, hear about your initial results, and I really want to dive into the SIMPA results in particular, uh, especially around this gender issue. I guess you are holding the mic next. Do you want to go next? or? Yeah, I'm happy to go next. Uh, um, I've got a very simple question. Yep. Who hid the Clean Energy Access Directory? There are so many people in this room looking around. We've got access to finance. We've got access to projects. We've got practitioners. Why is it not happening faster? I think there is a huge case to be made for some kind of knowledge pooling, um, best practice sharing, and it's not happening fast enough. So that's why I want, what I want to know. We could be evolving these business models so much faster, so more effectively, if there was more of this, and I use the trite word, energy directory. But if, if there were more examples of people networking and knowing what was going on, sharing experience. So I'd like to know why that's not happening. Excellent question. I wish I had the answer. <laughs> So coming to my side, I think the biggest understanding we got is that the underserved is not the same energy needs at, at all points. They are underserved who cannot afford to buy products but still need the lights, still need energy. They are the middle class of the underserved who require a different set of products. Then there is an elite in the underserved which needs a very different set of products. When we ever we discuss this, I think solar home systems to some extent cover that. Microgrids to some extent cover that. But as an industry, do we understand this? I think that is the biggest fear I have when meeting our customers. And are we developing the right solutions and products to meet the needs? I think the industry needs to introspect and figure out is, is that is what really happening? And are we meeting the needs? That is my biggest fear today, and that's what we as an organization have been working on to overcome. Anything left to say? Yeah, the oh, good. task moving <laughs> last. Um, I want to maybe direct it a little bit more to, to solar now. I mean, these points are really valid, like particularly for the, for the industry. Uh, maybe something that we've been struggling with as a, as a company really linked also to the, to the topic of this, this panel, like evolving business models is, is that, I mean, we initially started um, really with, with a dealer model where we worked with dealers that were not exclusive. Um, and we thought, you know what? We're going to bring a high quality product. We're going to introduce financing. We're going to offer a handsome commission to these, to these dealers. They're going to go like crazy. Like, we don't know like where we're going to get the products. Like, how are we going to get them fast enough into the country? And actually nothing happened. Really, like, we sold a few systems a month. It's just, it took off really slowly. So we transformed it into a more exclusive franchise model. We said, well, again, like we offer a nice, nice commission to the franchisees. We train them a little bit more intensively because they're exclusive. And again, it did not take off as much as we, um, as we expected. So it's like for us, like it's, it's really been a struggle and like, like a, a road to figure out what really motivates and incentivizes our, our sales staff and the people that work for us. How do we get them to buy into that notion that why we're all here is that we see that huge demand in this sector. We see a huge need. I mean, if you look at East Africa in particular, I mean, people do know about solar products. They are aware that these kind of solutions are there. Like we have um, like a sales staff. I mean, what, why is it not really happening? What drives people to really start selling these products? And what drives people to, to buying these products? 
And I think there we're still like everyone is still really looking for okay, like how do we really make this make this scale and how do we make this work um, in the sector? And that's really where we would love to have like more interactions, like more discussions around trying to understand like how do we really incentivize our our people to really yeah start start scaling to the to the next level. Great. So thank you. I think that was uh, sort of an excellent set of points that uh, that emerged. I'll just summarize them, at least the, the sound bites very quickly. At in interesting quotes. Where are the millions? Will we make an impact? We can only sell to men. That's a question mark, of course. Uh, who hid the energy access directory? I think that must get the best quote uh, award. Um, it's not under, uh, everybody's not underserved at the same energy point. And what motivates the staff and team? What drives people to buy and sell? And I'm sure when we uh, meet here next year, uh, Pam and Nikki will have figured out the answers to all of these questions and <laughs> we'll be having a big discourse to it.